Good evening and welcome to this public lecture organized by the Hindu Center for Politics and Public Policy. At the outset, I'd like to thank all of you for making it this, to this lecture, braving Chennai's reins. With your continued support from such a discerning and informed audience, the Hindu Center for Politics and Public Policy, a division of Kasturi and Sons Limited, publishers of the Hindu and group publications, is today organizing its 23rd event. The Hindu Center was organized by the President of India, Pranam Mukherjee, on 31st January 2013. Its aim is to promote research, dialogue, and discussion to enable the creation of informed public opinion on key issues facing India to safeguard, strengthen, and nourish parliamentary democracy and pluralism, and to contribute to the nation's economic, social, and political betterment. The Hindu Center has so far supported 24 short-term public policy scholars who submitted policy reports on areas such as parliamentary democracy, freedom of expression, content of school textbooks, financial inclusion, post office banking, and rural connectivity, to mention a few. All our reports are available online. The center's previous 22 events included a roundtable discussion on Telangana State, another on civility and politics, and one on public policy and the child in Tamil Nadu. Public discussions were also held on various issues such as violence against women, pre-election opinion polls, gender-based violence, sedition and free speech in India, Sri Lankan refugees in India, and so on. The Hindu Center has also organized a series of three lectures on climate change delivered by Jairam Ramesh, former Union Minister and Senior Visiting Fellow at the Hindu Center, and Alan Rusbridger, former Editor-in-Chief, The Guardian, UK. Our commentaries are available online and all of them are accessible at www.thehinducenter.com. Earlier this year, the Hindu Center's first annual lecture on Will India's Script and Uninterrupted Growth Story was delivered on March 13th by Peach Dambaram, former Union Minister. It is now my honor to introduce to you the moderator and the speaker for this event. First, the moderator for this evening's public interaction, Mr. Raghun Srinivasan. He also writes under the name Ravi Srinivasan. He's the editor of the Hindu Business Line. Srinivasan is a senior business journalist and columnist who has been reporting, analyzing, and interpreting the Indian growth story since the inception of economic reforms in India. Even prior to the start of reforms, he was one of the pioneers of corporate journalism in India, bringing first-hand experience and insight to reporting on Indian businesses since he switched to journalism after nearly a decade-long stint in marketing at major corporates. An investigative journalist of repute, he has, was also responsible for breaking major stories such as the Harshad Mehta stock scam, the return of coke to India, the collapse of UTI, among others. Currently the editor of the Hindu Business Line, he has in the past led editions and held senior positions in major newspapers around the country, including the Times of India, Indian Express, Hindustan Times, Mail Today, Financial Express, and Business Standard. It is. It is also my honor to introduce to you the speaker for this evening, Dr. Arvind Subramaniam. <laughs> Dr. Subramaniam is the Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India, Ministry of Finance, since October 16, 2014. He is on leave from the Peterson Institute for International Economics and Center for Global Development, Washington, DC. His award-winning book, Eclipse, Living in the Shadow of China's Economic Dominance, was published in 2011 and has printed 130,000 copies worldwide in four languages. In 2011, Foreign Policy Magazine named him as one of the top 11 global thinkers. In the same year, India Today named him as one of the top 30 masters of mind in India over the last 30 years. He has worked in the research department of the International Monetary Fund, the GATT, during the Uruguay round of trade negotiations and has taught at Harvard and Johns Hopkins universities. He has written on India, growth, trade, development, institutions, aid, climate change, oil, intellectual property rights, the World Trade Organization, China, and Africa. Today he will speak to us on cooperative and competitive federalism to foster reform, the case of the power sector. Dr. Subramaniam holds an undergraduate degree from St. Stephen's College, New Delhi, and Masters of Business, application from business Administration from Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, and MPhil and DPhil degrees from the University of Oxford. Dr. Subramaniam, the floor is yours, please. Uh, 
May I request that you please turn off your mobile phones or at the least put them on silent mode, please. Thank you. Preferably switch them off. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's, uh, let me also join uh, the Hindu Center in uh, thanking all of you for coming here on this somewhat formidable afternoon with, uh, you know, I think the rain gods are being good to Chennai, but maybe not so good for the event. But I'm glad to see a, a nice uh, audience here, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, I, I once made a remark, I think, uh, uh, to you some time ago that uh, if you think, if you live in Delhi and, and, and you live in Washington, I, th I think, and, and I'm not trying to be uh, uh, at all uh, in any way kind of uh, uh, want to, you know, play down one or play up another city, but, you know, the sense that a, a vibrant life of the mind, uh, uh, Delhi is very good at that in India. A and, you know, uh, my uh, uh, request always was that this should spread uh, to other great cities in India like Chennai. And um, so, so it's for me, it's particularly uh, delightful uh, to come here to the Hindu Center, which is in fact uh, becoming such a vibrant center uh, for, you know, uh, discussions about public policy, about all kinds of issues which were just uh, listed today. Uh, so it's really a pleasure to be here because I, I do firmly, firmly believe that not just, you know, the quality of, of discussion and debate, but also diversity of opinion is, is terribly important for, you know, deliberative policy making uh, in a country like India, in a democratic system like India. So I, I think it's, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, when I was told that, uh, you know, the venues the Music Academy, uh, I, was, I was delighted, uh, but also a little bit uh, embarrassed, um, you know, to think that, you know, maybe not quite this stage, but certainly uh, the, the hallowed stage downstairs uh, ha has been the place from where, uh, you know, the dulcet, divine sounds of MS Subalakshmi and, of course, my own uh, Carnatic music favorite, M.D. Ramanathan, have, you know, have issued from these hallowed uh, kind of uh, scenes. A and therefore, I, I, I feel like an absolutely inferior interloper uh, to, to, to succeed them, you know, it, in, in speaking from this, uh, from this stage. Um, when, when I thought about speaking here um, uh, and, and thought, what should I speak on today? Uh, obviously, I know that all of you want to talk about demonetization and GST, and uh, you know, at some stage in the Q and A, uh, we could come to that. If only if you want to. I'm not insisting that you should, uh, but we can come to that. But I thought I'd speak on on something a little bit more general, but also a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, uh, sector specific, a sector that all of you probably know quite well. I wanted to, in fact, speak on this topic of, you know cooperative and competitive federalism. I mean, why did I choose this topic? Apart from the fact that, of course, I, I do think that in some ways, India's future lies in what I call, you know, the virulent spread of competitive and cooperative federalism, which I'm going to explain to you uh, in just a moment. But I think, uh, for me, this topic has acquired salience because of the GST, the, the goods and services tax, because, you know, we're going to talk about all the, you know, the uh, pluses and the challenges that we face with the GST. But I think one thing or, or two things about the GST which are absolutely, I think, absolutely uh, noteworthy and remarkable, which is what I'm going to build on in, in talking about cooperative and competitive federalism. First, I think as a feat of cooperative federalism, just to get this consensus amongst um, so many states, so many union territories, so many parties, uh, you know, straddling, you know, ideological opinions, straddling intellectual authors, as it were, across time, you know, idea actually was originally mooted by uh, Dr. Chalaya, who, who set up uh, many great institutions here in Chennai as well. You know, Dr. Chalaya, Vijay Kelkar, and several others have contributed to this. So it's really a, a tribute to not just India's diversity and all of that, but also cooperative federalism in the sense that, you know, many parties came together, many states dropped their divergences, you know, 
platform and for a, for a larger cause. Uh, and just think of it, you know, it's not just that, but so many tax systems across the states, so many technologies which are so different across the state. Interests are very different. You know, if you sit in these GST council meetings, you're stunned by how much diversity there is in India. You know, uh, some state is only concerned about, you know, what the tariff on agarbatti should be. You know, that's kind of, you know, obsession number one. And for another state, it could be walnuts. And you have to deal with, you know, the, the grubby business of politics. And to make this happen in a country like India, I think is an astonishing feat. Um, uh, and I'm going to speak about cooperative federalism. The other sense in which I I think it is remarkable, and I'm going to come also build on that in the case of power, is that, you know, if you think about, and also if you look at the Constitution of India, which, which I did a little bit in the context of the last survey, what you find is that it, there is a great sense in wanting to create one political India. I think our founding fathers were obsessed with that, and I think it's a remarkable achievement. But you don't find the same concern in creating one economic India. Uh, and, and that's why, I, and, and, you, I, and you know, uh, if you look at, for example, what the Constitution says about creating one India, one economic India, and compare it with other comparable legal documents like you know, the United States Constitution, uh, Constitution or the European Constitution or even the WTO, World Trade Organization, you find that you know, uh, the Constitution basically says you know, states can do what they want as far as economics is concerned, but the GST has actually made us one market one tax. So, so the notion that we're going to become one economic India is something actually quite remarkable that the GST has achieved. So, so it's in the context of that that I want to extend that and, and talk about a cooperative and competitive federalism and apply that to the power sector, which I think is, is actually a, a very important sector in India. Now, what do I mean by Cooperative federalism. By cooperative federalism, it's, I mean something very simple that all the states and the union territories and the center come together for a common cause, which uh, is in India's greater good. Although there may be, you know, some, uh, you know, some states may win, some states may lose, but overall the country gains as a whole, and and that's what and it could it needn't be just in uh, on the economic side. It could be on water sharing. It could be on creating a, a common market. It could be all kinds of things. But the notion that people come together, shed you know, their things uh, for a larger cause. Uh, and I mean, the phrase we use in this and the phrase that the finance minister has used often to describe the GST is not that states are giving up their sovereignty, which to some extent they are, but everyone decides to pool sovereignty. You know, you give up some, but in return, others also give up some. And in the process, you end up becoming better as the sum of parts as you were, uh, than you were individually. So that's cooperative federalism. But then there's also competitive federalism. By competitive federalism, I mean, what I mean is that, you know, if one state does well on something, it acts as both a model and a magnet spurring other states to do the same thing as well. So a classic example, the nano, nano car many, many years ago, you know, uh, West Bengal was going to get it, but all, you know, all the things that happened, and in the old India, that problem, a project would probably have died. I mean, of course, I don't want to get into the virtues of the nano car as, as a piece of technology or marketing. We leave that aside. But when that happened, so many other states came forth and said, you know, we will, uh, uh, you know, give, make it very attractive for the Tatas to come and relocate. And finally, of course, Gujarat ended up getting that. So, so and similarly, I mean, I'm told, for example, some massive investments in the, in the auto sector, and, and you probably know this better than I do, Tamil Nadu lost because, for example, it couldn't provide uh, cheap, relatively cheap and uninterrupted power. Uh, I think that was, a, that was a case some five, six years ago. So, so th the notion that states then compete with each other to do, to attract investment, to pursue good policies, I, th I think that's competitive federalism. And I think it's one of the remarkable features about India that we have this dynamic going within the country that, you know, there is more and more pressure on different states to perform and, and thereby, you know, attract investment, create jobs, create growth. Um, you know, it's almost becoming a, a 
little bit of a joke that how many states and chief ministers have investor conferences both within and outside the country in order to attract and to say that, you know, we're a good place, we're a good investment destination. And so I think that's the competitive federalism logic. But of course, uh, I mean, uh, Let's also keep in mind that competitive federalism has a doppelganger, the, the you know the opposite, which is competitive populism. Uh, so 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 if there if there is a positive competitive federalism dynamic, you know states doing good things in order to attract investment. There's also the flip side, states doing you know for example the loan waiver. You know there's been a kind of competitive uh, thing to one state says we grant a loan waiver, uh, others say well it seems to be very political pop politically popular, we will emulate that as well. The best example, of course, is you know giving away free power in India, which I think has been uh, something that's been uh, a kind of object of competitive populism, uh, and so we have that other side as well. So how do we harness both cooperative and competitive federalism while kind of keeping in bay competitive populism I is what I want to you know spend some time on today in the context of the power sector. Now, <clears throat> Why I, I think I think in Tamil Nadu I think the power sector has particular resonance. I think you know uh, the Tamil Nadu State Electricity Board in the, in the old days, you know, uh, to, depending on who you are, uh, you know, you thought of it as not, not quite uh, well. Uh, within India, I think it's one of the better run electricity boards in the country. But even then, I think there were all kinds of uh, challenges that the electricity board faced. And and I think that um, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a very, very important sector in India. And I want to spell out what the challenges uh, there are um, and what the analogy is with GST and the role for competitive and, and uh, cooperative federalism. Now, <clears throat> fact number one, which... I wasn't aware of uh, until we started working on this. To me, it is a travesty, absolute travesty, that we do not have one market in power in India. Uh, to me, we are, as far as the power sector is concerned, we are completely balkanized. You know, uh, 29 states, basically 29 countries running the power sector, and I'm exaggerating a little bit, but uh, but we are not one India. So, so, the, so the, the analogy with the GST is that just as we created one tax economic India, can we create one market for power in India? A and the way we fragment, of course, I mean, just to give you one example, is that every state in India imposes a charge if, say, a, a, a factory in Tamil Nadu wants is not getting or is getting very expensive power from the DISCOM, the Tamil Nadu DISCOM, it, if it wants to buy power from the power exchange, which is really, uh, you know, kind of interstate trade, um, it, it faces a huge, that, that company will face a huge charge on that. And if you look at some of these charges, it's like all, sometimes more than 100% of the tariff itself. So I'm a trade economist. I look at it from a kind of trade perspective. Basically, this is what this is, is just rampant protectionism to, uh, to protect uh, something, domestic policies. Now, what is this protecting? It's interesting. What it's protecting basically partly is the inefficiency of the discoms in every state. Because recall that if I can, you know, if, if say you are the discom, and I don't buy from you and I buy from another state, you will start losing your business, your financial viability will be undermined, and, and, and basically uh, there will be a lot of stress put on you. So to prevent that stress, I think every state imposes these, uh, what they call cross-subsidy uh, cross subsidy surcharges, but basically think of it as a protectionist action by every state to preserve its own. The other thing, what it's sustaining also is, is the following, that in every state basically what you have is, um, you know, states do want to legitimately protect poorer sections from high costs of power, and I think th that's a very legitimate objective. So I'm I'm not at all of the view that you know everyone should pay you know a market price for power. Uh, I do think poorer sections need to be protected, and I'm going to come back to how we might do it better than we do. 
But what, what every state does, of course, is that it does that, it uh, tries to protect, but then you know, you're not going to be financially viable, so you have higher tariffs on other users like industry and commercial users. Then, of course, what happens is that because of that cross-subsidy, in order to re retain viable, your tariffs on industrial on users become so high as to make industry less competitive than it ought to be. A and that's the sense in which this whole system also undermines make in India, undermines manufacturing. And, and, and so, so, so we have here a system really of protectionism, balkanized economic India, in order to sustain what are actually not so good, not desirable policies at the level of every state. So, so, so if you think, so, so my segue from the GST into power really is that how can we create one market in India for power? I mean, we say we are one nation, but you know, we're not one nation as far as uh, electricity is concerned. And for a trade economist like me, it's an absolute travesty, and we need to fix that. So, so <clears throat> if you have that vision of a you know, one power India, then uh, you know, the role for cooperative federalism and competitive federalism follow, I think, quite, quite naturally. But before I get to that, before I just want to you know, <clears throat> give you a sense now a little bit of the state of the power sector in India. I think the power sector faces about you know, many, many, I mean, I think first of all, I want to note that we've made great progress uh, in the last few years on actually providing more power to people, to poorer people. You know, even in the last two years, the number of households electrified has gone up. The quality of our power supply, according to World Bank rankings, has improved tremendously. Uh, generation and transmission capacity have increased enormously. So we've made great strides on the physical side. And in some sense, I think what needs to catch up uh, is the financial side. And, and, and let me tell you what the challenges are. There are, I think, three or four big challenges in the power sector in India today. The first I spoke about, the fact that you know, we're not one market in power, and that therefore choice is restricted for many agents. It's not just choice for industrial users, it's choice for consumers, it's also choice for the discoms themselves. They are now stuck in, in kind of long-term contracts, which they kind of regret now. So, so there's a lot of impediments to choice all over the landscape uh, in the power sector. So that's one problem. The second problem, which of course maybe all of you know about, is that we have on the generation side these, uh, 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 in large part, a legacy of the boom of the 2000s. We have a lot of stranded capacity in power, especially in thermal power. And um, Credit Suisse estimates that about 2.4 lakh crores uh, of debt owed by these companies is under stress. In fact, if you think of the NPA problem in India, the sector which is probably the most implicated is the power sector. Uh, because, I don't know, 30, 40, 50,000 megawatts of, of capacity is stranded. A and if you look at actually plant load factors in India in the power sector, at least in the private sector, it's, it's barely above 55 to 60 percent. And, and if you think about it, we need to be in the 75 to 80 percent range for power generation to become viable. So on the generation side, you have this legacy of lots of capacity being built which is not being used, and then, boom, there's now the challenge of renewables. Essentially, uh, the price of renewables, solar and wind, is coming down day by day. It's plummeting precipitously. So what is happening is that the renewable sector is becoming much cheaper, and this is actually putting pressure on thermal plants. Part of the reduction we see, why we see plant load factors in thermal coming down is because people are using renewables, which are much more competitive, by and large, and I want to, I'll come to that later, but renewables are becoming more competitive. The government is actually fostering the use of, uh, promoting the use of renewables. So we're kind of stuck in this situation where the, all this capacity that we built was excess to some extent because of, of the optimism of the 2000s. And then along with that comes this challenge from the renewable sector. So the power generation's financial viability is, is kind of uh, uh, under, uh, uh, under question. Uh, and how we're going to get out of it is also how you know, re related to the problem of the NPAs and, and the recapitalization that the government recently announced. So that's on the, on the, on the uh, generation side. 
there's also what I spoke about on this fact that you don't have choice, you don't have one market. That's about you know the structure, the, the way in which the whole power sector is organized, lots of restrictions all over the place. And of course, the third and a big problem is of course, um, uh, the fundamental problem why we never had financial viability of the old electricity boards, boards and now the discoms is that the political process finds it very difficult to charge for power, at least to charge for power in a way commensurate with the cost of production. I mean, that's a fundamental, you know, um, you know, you know better than I do how every government, state government, comes and promises free power. And of course, the, the, the problem of the discoms we've experienced recently is an age-old story. It's not the first time it's happened. It's happened several times before, uh, and we keep coming back. And the heart of it is that it, we find it very difficult to charge for power. Now, so these are challenges on the generation side, on the discom side, and on the market structure side. But there's also a kind of broader problem with the power sector, which is that it is so non-transparent, so complex, uh, so not simple uh, at all. Anything that you see in the power sector, like everything about India, I, I think uh, we Indians love complexity. I think it's almost a badge of our kind of intellectual sophistication that you know we love this you know uh, uh, complexity. And you know, I, I, all, whenever I you know I, I I'm a simple-minded person who's kind of mentally un-Indian and lived most of the time abroad. And you know, when you come and have these discussions and you say, "What about this?" and the stock stock response, I always get it, but it's very complicated, very complicated. Lots of nuances here, there, you know. And I feel like saying, "Man, give me the simple bottom line, and let's get on with it," you know. So, so, so we love complexity. Even the GST, for example, you know, agarbatti is one rate, and you know, walnuts another rate, and cashew nuts another rate, you know. All, all this kind of thing goes on. And <clears throat> here, I want to give you a, a st uh, actually a, a true story, an, an example of complexity uh, in the power uh, sector. About a year and a half or two years ago, uh, I was in Bihar and I went to see the Chief Minister, Mr. Nitish Kumar. Uh, extremely thoughtful person, very, very thoughtful. Uh, and, you know, I spent about an hour and a half, two hours with him. Uh, it, it was really wonderful, but when I went in, I had just done, we, we had just done this work for the economic survey on the power sector. And I said, um, uh, uh, Honorable Chief Minister, I'm going to ask you, so I, begin, I began by saying, I'm going to ask you a question. Tell me, in Bihar, how many tariff rates for electricity do you have? And two of his kind of aides were also sitting. So he said, nay, mujhe nahi malum, I don't know. He turned to his people. They kind of hummed and hawed, and they weren't quite sure. And then he rang his uh, power secretary right away and said, bataiye, bataiye, hum kitne slabs hain hamare tariff rates ke? And, and he was also kind of basically fudging and you know winging it as he went along. He said, "Sir, punch the slab honge." So Mr. Uh, Nishkar uh, put down the phone and said, uh, uh, "Arvind ji, punch the hai." I said, "Challenge, N not possible. It cannot be only five ten. It's many more." So he picked up the phone again and uh, rang his person. And after about 20, 25 minutes, the man came and said, "Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. Maybe there are about 20, 25 tariff slabs." A, uh, for power. So we left the conversation with me saying, uh, I don't believe this, uh, Mr. Chief Minister. He's saying, Nene Arvindji, SIE hai. So the next morning I went, I checked the Bihar tariff schedule. I, I rang him back, and he was you know, graceful enough to receive the phone. And I said, uh, Mr. Chief Minister, I've checked. You have at least 65 to 70 slabs for tariff rates in, in, in Gujarat. And I can guarantee you that the actual number is probably twice that. Now, think about it. Think about this, that when we think of a market, you see, you go and buy you know, Pepsi or, or Coke, you know, the, it's one price. You know, if it's Coke, you know, it's Coke. A bottle of Coke, you pay a certain amount. But for power... I cannot, I mean, we have, if you, if you go to the, uh, to, to the text of the lecture, we showed this in the essay from, from a state. You ha I mean, the, the notion that truth is stranger than fiction, I mean, is proven in spades when it comes to, I don't know, the, the imaginations of the electricity regulators is far more riotous than any of us could imagine. There are slabs for 
pissy culture for you know rabbit farms small rabbit farms big rabbit farms you know um, panchayat but panchayat municipalities panchayat municipalities at day panchayat at night i mean this just goes on you will i mean i'm not making this stuff up there are hundreds of tariff slabs over and above that there are in rajasthan for example there's a discount if you have a bpl card there's a discount if you you know pay ahead of time all kinds of things how can you run any market system where a, a commodity has 100 200 prices depending upon when it's used how it's used where it's used you cannot run a market system but we know why this happens it happens because you know this kind of complexity actually encourages rent seeking encourages corruption you know you know that the pissy culture guy you know in order to get a lower rate has done some deal with the regulator where the, where the power is 5 rupees for everyone and he gets it at 4 rupees 25 paise or something like that so this is you know <clears throat> this kind of complexity <clears throat> is all over the system for example solar sub solar uh, power for example I've tried I don't know what kind of subsidies we give solar today. Uh, I I think the objective that the prime minister has is a very laudable one. I think we've we've changed the dynamic on climate change through our emphasis on on renewables and solar and getting away from coal. But uh, you know, we we give a lot of subsidies do we give it at the central level at the state level do we give it as direct expenditure do we give it as tax breaks are they on balance sheet are they off balance sheet i really don't have a clue so the question is that how can you make policies if there is such lack of transparency in the system so i think overriding kind of uh, uh, kind of generic issues of lack of transparency lack of simplicity is kind of a broader issue facing the uh, the um, power sector as well so how, how much time do i have another 5 10 minutes and okay so so now how should we address these problems you know all these challenges in in the power sector i i don't want to go through each and every every one of them you know the the, the power generation problem i think what is happening now more and more is the discoms that buy power they've been locked into these long term agreements to buy at 6 and 7 rupees and 5 rupees per kilowatt hour and they see the price of renewables crashing every day every auction for solar every auction for wind you know 3 rupees 250 even even lower than that sometimes and they say you know why should we okay so we we're stuck in these contracts we're going to repudiate these contracts and renegotiate them uh, and you know re basically renege on them even though the supreme court has said that you cannot and, and they're actually trying to renegotiate them uh, in order to buy in fact is interesting the discoms now are actually not buying according to their long term contracts and going and buying from the power exchanges because they get a much cheaper price but there's a problem here you know on the one hand we believe in sanctity of contracts you know if you sign a contract you've got to adhere to it especially if it's a government i mean it has to adhere to it but i have some sympathy for these discoms you know why should they pay 6 rupees when you know technology which they never anticipated nobody anticipated has led to prices at 2 and 250 and so on so um we need to there i think find a way of being able to renegotiate these uh, power purchase agreements and, and how we're going to do that i think is 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 a bit it's a big challenge uh, but that's one big problem there is the other i think uh, problem is the whole coal versus renewables uh, debate um you know i i gave a lecture the the 16th darbari said memorial lecture a few few uh, months ago where where you know <clears throat> again we have the same dilemma between coal and renewables you know everyone is really enthused about enamored with renewables quite rightly so because after all you know coal has so many problems um and the title of my lecture was provocatively you know renewables may be the future but are they the present and and, and sort of i was trying to make the case that we need to think a bit more carefully about this trade off because it's possible that if you look at the numbers carefully renewables are not yet competitive with coal as it were so and also we've been providing a lot of subsidies for renewables so so the broad argument that i was making there is that here's the funny thing and this was what motivated that lecture as well on the one hand we give subsidies for renewables in order to you know promote their use because of that actually plant load factors thermal use comes down 
the government owns <laughs> these via the public sector banks. Uh, when you have more NPAs, uh, the banks are in trouble, and the government has to, therefore the government has a double whammy. You, you give subsidies for the renewables, and you give money to pick up the tab for the reduced use of thermal that's been induced by uh, the subsidies that you've given for renewables. So I think we need to think much more carefully about how we do the coal versus renewables uh, uh, um, thing in India. And, and, and my suggestion was um, uh, basically maybe we should think about, you know, while we should continue to promote renewables, I, I think there may be a case for saying that let's subsidize it less until such time as we are convinced that renewables does become competitive with coal, and maybe that's the time to, to uh, you know, promote renewables and use greater renewables as well. So, so that's on the, you know, the coal versus renewables, on the NPA. Uh, as, as I said, I want these cross-subsidy surcharges. I want India to be one market for power, not just because you know, that has to be the animating vision for all of us in this 21st century, one economic India, but also because by doing that, you will put pressure on the discoms to become more efficient and to better price uh, power as well. On the, on, the power, uh, on the paying for power, I think it's a much more complicated problem. How do we get people to pay for power? One of the surprising things we did find, okay, actually this is one, one small insight I want to give about this problem of paying for power. Think about the, Think about the telecommunications revolution in India, you know, 20 years ago. You know, we remember how everyone was, in, had a, was on a waiting list to get these phones because it was a public sector monopoly uh, and things were very difficult, right? But essentially what happened was technology. Now, technology came in and helped in two distinct ways. The first obvious way is that it reduced costs. So, you know, much more easy for everyone to have access to it. But technology did one more very important thing in the case of telecommunications. It created or allowed for a mechanism of delivery of telecommunication services that did not require you know, public sector monopolies. It did not require landlines. So anything that had big fixed costs and required kind of centralization and monopolization, technology basically did away with that. Now, Roll forward 20 years, what is happening in, in, in power is actually something while, you know, while the, the reduced cost of technology for renewables is creating problems for our thermal thing, in some ways it's actually a development to be celebrated because basically what it's saying is that in the long run the cost of power is going to come down enormously. That means that it ca we can make it more possible for more people to pay for power. After all, you know, if you only have to pay two rupees uh, to make the sector viable, it's going to be much easier politically than asking people to pay four rupees per kilowatt hour, for example. So there's a great opportunity here created by, uh, you know, technology in, the, in renewables. But what this technology has not done as yet, which is what makes the problem complicated in power, is that you still need these monopolies. You still need the transmission towers. You still need the, you know, the lines uh, and, and all of that, the metering and all of that, which is going to make uh, power a little bit more intractable than, than the, the technology revolution in telecommunications. So uh, I think that's a challenge. I think there's, there's an opportunity here uh, for getting people to pay more for power. Uh, by technology, but I think we need to harness it properly and so on. Now, <clears throat> I want to end by going back to the theme of cooperative and competitive federalism and power. See, the question is, okay, what role or business does the center have in power? Many, many decisions on power, you know, tariffs, regulations, etc., are determined by the states. So this is not like GST where you know, the center had taxes, the state had taxes, they all came together. Center levies no tariffs on, on power. It's all done by the state. So what is the role, what is the case for cooperative federalism and for the center taking a kind of lead role as it were? Power is on the concurrent list, everything is done by the states. So the states can turn around and say, what business do you have to be in a, an actor or a player in this sector? And my answer to that is actually uh, twofold. Why I think the center has an 
absolutely a very important stake and the ability to do that. And that's what I want to end with and give you some examples. What is the stake? If you think about it, whether it's power generation or whether it's the discoms, finally, when things go bad financially, it comes back to the central government in one way or the other. In the case of generation, the NPAs that have, been, that have happened hit the public sector banks. Government owns the public sector banks, so the government is implicated in that. Similarly, we've just done this Uday scheme, where basically the discoms were not in very good shape. Uh, the state government took over some of these things. But these state things are finally guaranteed, or people think they're guaranteed by the center. And of course, state finances are very important for, for the center because overall macroeconomic stability depends upon what the states do as well. So the center has you know, a deep financial stake, which happens again and again and again. So the center has a very important role to play. Second, as I've said so many times ad nauseum even in this lecture, you know. It, the center has a stake. In fact, it's absolutely its first order of business for the center to make sure that we're one India. We can't be a balkanized economic India in power. We cannot let the states you know, impose these things and create fragmented markets in India. So that's the second thing. Now, how can this co competitive and cooperative federalism be used uh, in, uh, in India? See, I can think of many ways where the, the center can do it. The center can do sticks and carrots. For example, in the case of the Uday scheme, the center used uh, carrots, for example, saying you do this, you'll have lower interest rates, and that was an incentive for states to perform. The center, for example, can um, basically say, we will not allow these cross-subsidy charges. We will insist, and maybe even invoke the Constitution to say, we must have one market in power. Wheel that stick to ensure that states uh, undertake reforms. Uh, the other thing that the center can do, of course, is that you know, if you think about what I, I mean, I haven't showed you that you know, every state has a tariff schedule that has you know, hundreds of, of tariff slabs. What the center can do, of course, is that bring all the regulators together, <coughs> which actually the Ministry of Power, to its great credit, is doing now, to get these regulators together and say, look, this is, you know, this is not serious. We have to have some kind of rational, rationality uh, and simplicity in the design of tariffs. It can bang heads together. It can provide capacity to the, you know, if you look at the quality of regulation in, 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 the, state uh, in, in the state regulators, it's very variable. I think that if we had, you know, if we beefed up our quality and had better regulators, regulators who kind of took their technical job much more seriously. You know, There's so much that can be done in order to make these things much better. The other thing that the center can do is, is to reward good practice. You know, um, if, for example, a state implements DBT in power, the center can say, well, we will actually finance some of that. Uh, and that's a way of inducing uh, better policies as well. Uh, finally, and I think this is a pet theme of mine, I mean, in the GST, for example, electricity is not part of the GST. Um, and that what it does, of course, if electricity is not part of the GST, uh, taxes get embedded, electricity taxes get embedded, and the cost of power in India, and therefore the cost of manufacturing, the competitiveness of India suffers. So you, know, you bring all these people together and say, look, let's get uh, uh, electricity into the GST. It's in our larger good. Maybe some states will lose. Maybe the center can compensate you as it is doing under the GST. So there are really a, a, a lot of things that can be done within this framework of cooperative and competitive federalism, like we've done for the GST, which we can do for power. And it seems esoteric, the power sector seems very technical. I mean, if you get into the uh, details of this, it's really a very complicated thing. But if you step back and said, no, we must have a vision for one market in power, we can bring it about by the center taking this lead role and fostering this cooperative and competitive federalism. I think not just for the power sector, I believe that this is a model that should be used across the board in other sectors. You know, water sharing, creating a common market. Because India is getting more and more decentralized. Um, that's a fact. Uh, it's something that we should possibly also celebrate. Um, but the way you, th then the way to make this thing work as a country gets more decentralized is to, on the one hand, 
get more cooperation so that common interests can be pursued, and also unleash the dynamism that comes from decentralization. Make Tamil Nadu compete with Gujarat to attract investment based on having a better, a better quality of power, lower cost of power. Therein lies, as I like to say, in the virulent spread of cooperative and competitive federalism, drawing upon the experience of the GST, the GST is an early harbinger in this respect, therein lies the future of economic India. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Subramaniam. Uh, may I um, add to the my personal welcome to Chennai? Um, uh, it's also actually a good day to be in Chennai and not in Delhi. My wife lives in Delhi, and she was telling me that uh, haze, the, uh, haze. the haze is so yeah. bad that visibility is down to about 10 or 15 meters, and uh, it's difficult to breathe even inside the house, even with the doors and windows shut. <laughs> Anyhow, so Chennai has some plus points, even if it rains a bit now and then. Yeah. Um, yeah, before I sort of, uh, you know, take the discussion uh, to the floor, I just thought that maybe we could um, uh, discuss a couple of, uh, uh, you know, uh, points that you touched upon in your speech and uh, maybe elaborate on it uh, with specific reference to the power sector, which you focused on. Um, if you look at the genesis of the problem, um, would you say that there has also been actually a sort of long-term uh, failure of policy, should I say, in uh, really addressing the right problem? Because uh, historically, and even today, I think the policy weight is towards, uh, you know, basically uh, solving the power generation side issue. It's seen as a capacity problem and not as a market problem. Uh. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, I think that, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, I think it, it may have been true at, at, at a certain point in time, but after all, we have focused a lot on the discom and the retail side as well. We did have, you know, in fact, if, uh, the Central Electricity Act of 2004 very much f the first NDA government under Suresh Prabhu, uh, I mean, when he was a power minister, very much had this focus of open access, which is basically about creating competition in the entire space altogether. That's so, and second, also, you know, recently with the whole uh, Uday bond scheme, the Ujula scheme, Uday scheme, uh, you know, recognizing that. Uh, the state of the discoms is, is pretty powerless. Uh, we have to uh, do something about it. So I, <clears throat> while there is still emphasis on, I think, for polit good political reasons, you know, you want everyone in India to have access. You know, as I say to my carbon imperialist friends uh, overseas who say, oh, you should not use coal, you should do renewables, I say every Indian must have uninterrupted access to 24-7 power, must be hooked to the grid. The cheapest way of doing that is, so I think that the quantity side, it's still important, but I think uh, more and more awareness that it's not just about pushing quantities and pushing this uh, generation and so on, but also the financial viability, market structure, getting people to pay for power. I think it's becoming part of the, uh, the discussion now more and more. Uh, isn't uh, the problem also, um, you know, uh, if I may uh, term it, uh, a fundamental dishonesty in government. Uh, basically, they do not want to, uh, you know, A, recognize subsidies as subsidies, and two, they don't want to pay for it, but want to derive the benefits. I mean, one of the root factors for this incredibly complex uh, set of tariffs that we have in the power sector is that they're trying to hide all kinds of little, little subsidies as not subsidies. Yeah, no, no, I, I think absolutely. I, I think there is something about the political process that lends itself to this. Um, uh, and I think we have to act on it on many fronts. I think, you know, the whole bid for transparency, get transparency into the system, you know, show this the uh, uh, you know the, the, what they call the Dracula effect uh, 
bring sunshine into this is very important. But yes, but uh, the truth is that you know, uh, complexity, non-transparency, I think, is another way of trying to hide, hide this. Um, but then you have to ask, the, 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 uh, because remember, uh, it's not costless. I mean, they do pay the cost. I mean, uh, industry, uh, you know, leaves, for example. Uh, as a result, investment suffers, growth suffers. So, so, uh, uh, but, but somehow, that doesn't translate into the political calculus as much as it ought to. Uh, and that's kind of one of the frustrations of, of democratic politics, that in many cases, such things don't kind of seem to matter enough uh, for, for change to happen. And, and so, you know, so all of us have to just keep banging away. I hope the Hindu center will also do this. Yes, <laughs> certainly. Uh, also, you know, I mean, you, you know, uh, you talked about, you know, democratic pol politics and, and GST is a good example of, uh, you know, uh, essentially uh, a democratic process of uh, tariff setting. But uh, I wonder whether uh, also, you know, whether true democracy is at work in this GST process or that uh, people simply, uh, you know, at the end of the day, because they have to achieve consensus now that the constitution has been amended, is to give in to the loudest bargainer. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, to, no, not really. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I've sat through these GST council meetings, many of them, almost all of them, and I am actually so, uh, I have been absolutely thoroughly impressed with the process. Look, democratic politics will always have its grubby side, right? I mean, that's inherent. I mean, show me a system that doesn't have grubby politics and it's not a democracy. You know, that's just a, a part of that. Uh, but if you put that aside and see, you know, how this thing operates by consensus, how people are, uh, you know, rise above their own state interests, the quality of discussion, I mean, the quality of the ministers, some of the ministers, uh, is really outstanding. And of course, the finance minister does a, I mean, amazing job of, you know, keeping, because think of this, not one decision in the GST has not been arrived uh, without consensus. So that's, I think that's quite an achievement of, of kind of democratic, uh, democratic uh, decision making. But it's true. I mean, it's. Uh, I spoke about one grubby side. I think the other thing was that once the center promised this 14% compensation to the states, I mean, the incentives did change. The kind of the dynamic did change to some extent, which of course uh, is something that we were aware of. But you know, in order to get that consensus, it was felt that it was a kind of um, uh, a cost worth paying. Um, and look. To some extent, what it's done, of course, is to uh, now states, the fact that they get this 14% compensation, they now have an incentive to bring rates down, right? Now, in itself is not a bad thing. I mean, you do want lower rates, you, but the problem is that if it could happen in a more structured and rational manner, rather than a haphazard manner, I think that would be great. I mean, if, for example, we just had you know, two rates or whatever it is, a more simpler structure of rates, then that kind of, you know, uh, bringing down rates, it might not be such a bad thing because it's a combination of complexity and the kind of slightly arbitrary nature induced by these incentives we've created that I think, you know, needs to be tweaked a little bit going forward. But if you look at the initial experience uh, post-introduction of GST, for instance, um, uh, the, the, the efficiency gains, the tax efficiency gains, the transaction co cost uh, gains, uh, don't appear to be really getting passed along. It's one of the reasons for widespread uh, sort of public resentment is that everybody has felt actually an increase rather than a decrease. Uh, wh what is the solution to this? See, uh, look, first of all, um, there's so much, I think one has to distinguish between the perception and, and the reality. So I, I'm not saying perception is not important. I think maybe in politics it's all perception. Uh, but I think one has to be careful about... See, remember that it was always going to be a difficult um, communication problem because, just to give you an example, the excise tax never featured in the bill that the consumer was paying. 
but the tax was embedded in the bill. But now, so in the old days, the consumer saw bill 14 and 12 and a half percent VAT, and he thought it was 12 and a half percent. But he didn't see that the price itself was inflated because of the excise tax. Now you see, oh, 9 and 9, 18. So 18 is greater than 14 and a half, and you think things have gone up. So that's at the perception level. At the level of fact, maybe in some cases it has happened. But I can uh, tell you that the, it, there was a absolutely a, a, a concerted, conscious effort to make sure that every rate basically was at or below the pre-existing rate when everything was taken together. To some extent, maybe it hasn't completely panned out uh, as we'd envisaged, but I think we're making, uh, uh, you know, remember also that uh, this is such an enormous exercise. I mean, the complexity of it is mind-boggling. It's just mind-boggling. Um, that it was going, I mean, nobody ever thought it was going to be flawless or smooth. I think what is important now is that we learn from our, you know, the experience. Uh, we, we reduce the compliance burden on the small guys. We bring down taxes, which I think is happening, will continue to happen. And I think once the system stabilizes over the next few months, you know, I am co uh, confident that we will get huge compliance benefits from this. I think even my early reading of the evidence is that there are many, many more new taxpayers in the GST than there ever were under VAT, service tax, and excise put together. So we are seeing those compliance, it, but the system will take some change. We, we're making, trying to make it easier on, on you know, uh, the forms are a bit complicated, the filing is a bit, you know, maybe uh, uh, difficult. I think all of these are being ironed out and over six to nine months, I think over the next few months, I think things will stabilize. Uh, it, you know, GST, in fact, is the success story of uh, cooperative federalism. But uh, that also has, to a certain extent, uh, taken away an element of ability to compete on part of states. Because so far, most of the competition was basically based on taxes and tariffs, right? And uh, that is now no longer possible. You have a unified uh, national um, you know, tariff for a particular type of um, activity or product. Um, so, you know, so how, how do states, you know, compete and how does it fit into the sort of federal structure that we have? What, what is the form that this competition could take? So, so th that's actually a, a terrific question. It's, 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 a, it's a very, very good, very, you know, something that, uh, you know, for example, many states, including Gujarat, for example, would give uh, ex uh, what's it called uh, VAT concessions and so on. Now, <clears throat> and to some extent, uh, in this case, you're right that cooperative fe federalism has come to some extent at the, ex at the expense of competitive federalism. So how, how do we think, should we think about that? I think the way to think about this is the following. I think that, you know, in advanced countries, for example, right, when you have these kinds of structures, you fear this race to the bottom, right? So in a sense, what you want uh, states to compete on the basis of other things than tax rates. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, you want you know, states to say, it's okay, I can't give you a lower tax, because remember, uh, that tax competition in some ways may be good for a state, but we know in the aggregate it's not good for the country because it's, it's a zero-sum yes. game. So that taking away of cooperative federalism is not such a bad thing, provided it, it induces states to compete on things that are not zero-sum games. You know, better power, you know, uh, cheaper power, uh, ease of doing business. So I think it transfers the burden on the competitive federalism to, I think, more desirable ways of competing than these zero-sum tax games. Uh, in, in fact, uh, even if you take the example of the power ste uh, sector uh, on which you dwelt on at length, um, you know, this uh, sort of uh, interstate competition, if you will, has also been um, essentially uh, driven by uh, the fact that the state has sort of uh, near monopoly control over the distribution side of the business. So you give you access, you don't give access, you give preferred supply, you know, you g guarantee uninterrupted power and everybody else has a blackout. Um, so th these, are, these are elements which are all part of an imperfect market. Yeah, but that's why I think, that's why this, you know, if you have one market in power, less able to do that. If you can't do it, yeah. you know, 
you can buy it from some other state. That's why for me, you know, expanding choice and competition. And in this case, it is not about, you know, privatization or not about privatizing. It's about increasing choice and competition and creating one market. Mm -hmm. And then there will be pressure on these unsustainable policies to kind of uh, unwind themselves. Yeah. So why do you think that we haven't actually managed to... Audience. Audience. Sorry. Yes, yes. Yes, we have got now. Okay, uh, very engrossing yes. questions, uh, you know, in yes, discussion. Yes. So I beg your pardon. Yes, uh, let me, um, you know, uh, put the floor open. Just a couple of ground rules. Please uh, restrict it to an actual question and not a statement of you. And do try to be brief. Yes. And, and, and only one question at one time. Yes, yes. Stood up for it. Yes. Um, would it, would it be right to say that some years ago, the idea was mooted and also implemented, the setting up of national power grid. One nation, one grid was the objective. And to integrate the entire country into one seamless network and to meet the objectives which you have stated, uh, has that, is that the way forward or has something has gone wrong there? No, uh, I, I think that, you know, there is still a need for one uh, common infrastructure of the national grid. I mean, that's true everywhere. Uh, and I think we've made a lot of progress. The fact that you have power exchanges now is only possible because of having one grid. Uh, so I think that's, you know, the need for public investment. See, these are public goods which have to be supplied by the government. Huge benefits from that. And so having one grid you know, in fact, at some stage, we will also have to get all our solar stuff, you know, uh, connected to the grid as well. So the grid is absolutely essential. And we're making a lot of progress on that. Yeah, yeah please. Yes, uh, and that then gentleman over there at the back. That worries me a little bit. Yeah, may, <laughs> I, may I also request you to identify yourself? It'll be nice for the speaker to know whom he's talking to. No, one, only one, only one. One minute, one minute, Trump has dynamically invested in hundreds of companies in South India. If you say make it Swadeshi, Swadeshi, but why you are bringing 100,000 uh, foreign investors here? In Coimbatore, they tried digital flash, which also has its own advantages. So. The, the, the good thing is that I don't have to respond to that question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Into, into the mic because it's being recorded, please. Yeah. Please wait, yeah, your, please. Uh, wait your turn, please. Gentlemen at the okay. back. Right I think there, right? I was the first to raise my hand. <laughs> yes. We need cooperative federalism, not competitive yes. federalism. Uh, good evening. Thanks for the enlightening talk. My name is Vignesh. Um, I have a background in renewables and I have read a lot of your critique pieces. Uh, I agree to a large extent, but they, there are points of disagreement. That apart, I specifically want to focus on the topic of uh, power reform. Uh, you know, there's been multiple acts uh, and the amendment since the Electricity Act of 2003 uh, to not only look at, <coughs> uh, you know, the utility point of view, but to also give the end consumer uh, the choice, mm. uh, which to date uh, has been more than uh, a decade and a half. And I think it's not moved for various reasons, you know, po partly political, partly structural. The question is there has been enormous political will to move the GST. But, and uh, the, the reason it's connected to, uh, the GST is connected to the question is, if you cannot compete on taxes, because taxes are a way to redistribute in some ways productivity between different sectors in a state, you have to compete on productivity and power plays a big role in productivity. Uh, so in that case, why, uh, why is there so much stalling on productivity uh, in the power sector from a consumer standpoint? Everything that you said about the cost to lay lines, etc., other economies have tackled it in the way of giving reasonable returns on fixed capex versus better returns on better services, uh, the analogy of the telecom sector. So just trying to understand what is it that uh, is stalling that kind of a thought process in power and, and why not use the technologies, you know, like solar. Uh. Yeah, I, I mean, 
Uh, I think th th that is, uh, you've asked a kind of uh, a great and existential question, you know, why have broadly power reforms been not as rapid as, as in other sectors? And, you know, I, I, I do think that at some level, um, the notion that you have to recoup your investment from the consumer, I think that's always been very difficult, especially when you have a lot of poor consumers. Uh, I think that's, in a sense, and it's a very understandable problem, right? After all, we did the same thing in telecom. I, I think things are changing. I, I think, for example, that there is greater awareness, and I think the Ministry of Power is moving in that direction, to have more competition for consumers as well. After all, we've had some experiments on that in some cities uh, with mixed results. Uh, some have done better than others. I think we're going to draw upon that. And I think you know if we can get more competition on the consumer side, but then back it up with the, some of the other things that I said, plus technology making this cheaper, I mean, then you have to get into the metering, you know, all these complications arise. Uh, so uh, I, I don't have a great answer or, or even a very good answer to your question because it, it's something that uh, clearly needs a lot more work. A and whether the political system is now up to that or not, and, and of course a, a derivative question of yours which is very good is that why have we been able to do this on, on GST but not on power? Uh, I think on the GST, I think maybe taxes are more salient. I think they're more important in some ways. Uh, I think that's why we've got progress. Uh, but yeah, but I think we're moving on power. I, I think that uh, it's going to happen. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, just on the access side, you know, India today and India 15, 20 years ago for even the common man, I mean, it's night and day difference to, to use a kind of power metaphor. And, and, and so I think things are moving. I, I think it's a matter of time. But technology is really going to help come to our benefit. I think we should harness that. And I think we'll make a lot of progress, I think, in the years to come. Thank you. Uh, so Ravi had a question here. Yes. You spoke of, uh, you suggested rather, that power could be brought under GST at some time. Power is one of the big four now left out, the others being petroleum, liquor, and uh, real estate. The real test of cooperative federalism is going to come later when you try to bring these uh, under GST. How much harder is that going to be? Yeah, actually, you know, actually, that's a uh, good question. I think that uh, I'm actually very heartened by uh, how much already there's pressure building up to bring some of these things in. I mean, for example, many of the transporters want, you know, petroleum to be brought in. There's a huge cry b for to bring natural gas into this, which you've seen as well. And there's more and more a pressure to bring land and re real estate. You know, I, I was involved in some of these land and real estate discussions on this. Uh, there are lots of uh, governments, uh, including Delhi, for example, and others who want to push land and real estate into GST. So yes, you're right that bringing some of these will be a, a, another, lit I wouldn't say the litmus test, another test for cooperative federalism because I think we've, we've made a lot of progress and I think it will happen sooner rather than later. Uh, liquor, of course, is going to be tricky because it's, it's a con the, it's the con you know, the, uh, it, the constitutional amendment doesn't have that. So we'll have to change the constitution to, uh, but the day that liquor comes in, I think we should all open a bottle of wine, I think. Um, my name is Rajendra Kumar. I am a chartered accountant. As an economist, how do you look at the concept of fiscal neutrality and the India GST? That's my question. Thank uh, you. Could, could you explain? Because, I mean, I can interpret fiscal neutrality in many ways, uh, but what S precisely did you have in mind? Spurring of demand and supply having no connection with your rates of taxes. See, th see, uh, I was, as you know, I was asked to write a report, uh, you know, two years ago on one aspect of fiscal neutrality, which is how do you design a structure of rates that will guarantee you guarantee that you get as much revenue afterwards as before. So that's that's fiscal neutrality as well. Um, and and I think that we are I think pretty much on course. Uh, I, I think that um, what I had said in that report, uh, which I think um, is going to be borne out to an even greater extent than I envisaged, is that the, you see, 
my, my vision for this was that we should err on the side of having lower and simpler rates because I felt that the GST would bring in a lot more taxpayers and would bring in better compliance. I think it is happening. So in fact, we are going to be, I think when the whole thing stabilizes, we will achieve fiscal neutrality with lower levels of taxes. And that would be a highly desirable outcome. And especially if some of the things that Mr. Ravi said, you bring in other taxes into the system, I think if you broaden the base, I think that will happen to an even greater extent. But I think on the revenue side, we're broadly fiscally neutral. Right, uh, Mr. Ram. And, uh, uh, with respect to uh, the distribution companies being confronted with these uh, PPAs, and the contracts, and given what you said about the Supreme Court. Now, surely many of them were entangled with cronyism and corruption, <laughs> these agreements, uh, if they look unreasonable. Can't you get into that aspect and force those uh, PPA holders, the, con the contract holders, to exit without uh, this, that kind of pressure of investigating this? That could be one way. Otherwise, you're stuck. I think... Um it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough question. See, I think that to some extent the bankruptcy process will have to deal with some of these issues. Um, and to the extent that the power things come in, I, I think that we will have to, you know, these things will become more transparent. And, you know, in some cases, promoters will have to take a hit uh, for bad decisions made. Uh, they will get... Uh, 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 written off and they'll have to take a hit and you know they will have to lose control so I think that process I think the, under the IBC uh, 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 some of that should happen the trickier case involves um, for which I don't have a good answer is what if it's not a kind of bankruptcy type situation but basically you have to kind of a, a kind of quasi legitimate renegotiation you know force majeure something happens you know, pr uh, you know input costs go up what do you do with that situation? I, and I, I do think that, you know, leaving, even leaving aside, I think the cronyism complicates it a lot. But I think the broader issue is that, on the one hand, we believe in sanctity of contract. Um, on the other hand, pragmatism dictates that how can you ignore, you know, either force majeure or enormous changes in technology which have made these old contracts uh, a little bit redundant. And I think we're going to have to navigate our way through that case by case, institution by institution. I am Vishwanathan, Eddie Tender, Steel Economist. Your advocacy of coal is a little uh, paradoxical. You have been doing it very forcefully, uh, uh, support, uh, advancing the case of India. But look at the paradox. Already, the plant load factor of most of the power stations are falling. Once you used to buy it for 70% plus. For some of these, it has fallen to less than 40%. Correct. You are advocating now more coal-fired stations. Unless you decide a particular cost of direct uh, tariffs, how will it fit with the competitiveness we are advocating? One, one more small question. It's, it's a very big question. Can I, can I take that? See, see, first, I want to make clear is that I am not advocating, uh, uh, you know, building new coal-fired stations. Uh, I, I have nowhere said that, and I've had these long discussions. You know, that's a more tricky case. I'm not advocating. No, no. So what, what I am saying is that the existing capacity that we've invested in coal and thermal, those should be, uh, you know, much better used. There we have plant load factors of, you know, as you said, 50, 40 percent. We have to get that up to 75, 80. And remember, m my argument is that some of that decline in plant load factors, right, some of it is due to, you know, whatever the economy is what it is, all these external reasons. But some of it is also due to the fact that we have subsidized renewables. So, so, so the policy dilemma is if you subsidize renewables, money from the government, 
As a result, you reduce plant load factors, increase NPAs, and have to recapitalize the banks. That's more money from the government. Does it make sense for the government to do this double whammy? That's the question. So, and I think, um, and m my argument is that maybe we should subsidize this less until we get the most out of our existing thermal capacity. I think maybe we should. That begs the question, Arvind. Yeah. You, you, you have to look at it. You, on the one hand, you, you point to a competitive economy. Yeah. How can you direct a particular segment? You see, we have the paradox here. Uh, Adanis came here with a big plant here for this thing. These are done on dubious means. The government agreed for 5 rupees 50 paise per unit. Now, because of surplus power, they are reneging on the contract. See, that 550 also involved a lot of, uh, lot of underhand so, so, dealings. So, 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 remember, see, I, I'm com what I'm saying, in fact, is completely consistent with the competitive economy because in this case, my prescription is reduce the subsidies for renewables. It's, that is, why should we, government, intervene in that? In fact, so I want to make it more competitive with less subsidies. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Yeah. See, I'm Rangarajan. See, you have explained very nicely, thank you very much, about the transmission and distribution. If you see the international figure, India is very high. How are you going to brought to the China level? China is the lowest, according to the figure available here. What is our uh, your idea? How, how the government is going to face that? My second point is about wind, solar, and thermal, you have explained. See, some of the foreign direct investment, for example, China is coming here with the turnkey system, which affects our own BHL and other companies. How are you going to tackle that? Uh, yeah, so look, on the, on the, on the transmission and distribution losses, and in fact also our commercial losses are, are somewhat high, um, that is a, a symptom, not the cause. That's the symptom. Um, and it's come about for many reasons that I tried to explain in the lecture, you know not being able to pay for power, the inefficiencies that are sustained by having these, you know, balkanized, fragmented markets where, you know, because you have that, inefficiencies are sustained. So you really need a package of measures. There's no one thing that you can do to reduce the T&D losses. It, you have to do a, a packet of things, you know, on the generation level, the distribution level, paying for power, creating one market, handling the coal versus renewables. You have to do a lot of things. There's not just one thing that you can do. On the whole question of, um, you know, Chinese uh, kind of um, imports and, you know, ch Chinese, uh, look, I, I, this is a, 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 a kind of very tricky question, right? That on the one hand, as an economist, you want to say, that anything that brings in more investment, you know, increases productivity, reduces costs, is a good thing. I mean, and I think all of us at some level believe that. But I don't think as a major economy and a rising power, we can completely ignore geopolitics. Uh, so uh, these are complicated decisions that have to be made. And my own view is that you know we have to you know take into account uh, this thing, but I do believe that you know uh, there was an old saying that countries that trade goods don't trade blows, uh, and so you know in in that sense, if uh, more economic integration can be a glue that can also help. Uh, 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 so because remember now uh, with the U.S. administration you have a very different view of trade. Trade is seen as a zero-sum game. It's about power and conflict. And we're all nervous about that, right? Uh, about where that will lead to uh, going forward. Uh, so so I, I am more partial to the view that while, you know, kind of geopolitics is very important, cannot be ignored, has to be factored in policy making, but we also have to believe in the power of economic integration to actually help solve problems around the world. 
Hello, sir. Uh, I'm Sai Shri, and I'm working with Goldman Sachs in the lending department. So I have a question. Uh, it is more from a reform standpoint. Uh, I would like to understand what is the role of investment banking in bringing reforms to public sector, considering that the corpus and the in, uh, the corpus of the investment second is the appetite to take risk. So when it go, both goes well for an investment bank, so what is the scope for them in the public sector? And my second question is. Um, so, 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 so I, you know, um, it's good that you didn't ask this question in the United States in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, because uh, you know uh, this guy from Rolling Stone had this great expression for Goldman Sachs, uh, a vampire squid that has its tentacles all around the economy, or some such very uh, you know lurid uh, imagery. Uh, so. Uh, you're asking that you know 10 years after the crisis yeah. and in india not the united states so it's a safer question to ask um you know uh, look the question is a broader one what is the role of finance in development and you know investment banking is one part of that um i think i think finance has a very important role to play i think financial inclusion which this government has kind of emphasized has a terribly important role i mean bringing people into the financial system the poor whether on the payment side or especially on the credit side is terribly important uh, I, I, and i think th that for me the more people who can get more poor people who can get access to credit i think it's unambiguously good for the economy but People around the world are rethinking the role of finance more broadly. You know, finance has proved to be, at least in the advanced countries, the tail that has wagged the dog and taken it in somewhat undesirable directions. Uh, you know, uh, the whole role of the financial sector is coming into question. So I think we need to have a healthy kind of embrace, uh, you know, financial sector but have a slightly healthy skepticism about what it can or cannot do. Uh, but on the financial inclusion for the poor, I think if Goldman Sachs can do more of that, uh, unambiguously good for the Indian economy. <laughs> but, but whether that's your clientele, I don't know. <laughs> uh, at the back, uh, yes. yes. Well, Namaskaram. Namaskaram. I am Ramesh, a contemplative economist. Well, I, I, I... Are you implying that I'm a non-contemplative <laughs> economist? <laughs> please, please, no, no, I'm joking. Please, please. Uh, Thanks for the um, lighter veined comment. Uh, well, uh, I am able to observe a triple whammy, not just a double whammy, in the sense that we, are, we seem to be having excess capacity in terms of power generation. And with the existing capacity that we are having, we are going... Mm, through a less amount of power generation that is being done, and something is being spoken around like 55% uh, and also 40 and 45, and all kinds of numbers. And at the same time, we are having a nascent industry in the form of uh, the other non-fossil fuels being uh, pushed up and uh, propped up and stuff like that, and uh, with all these uh, photovoltaic cells and all coming into the the Indian market, and, uh, and which is yet to take off in a big way. So we seem to be having triple whammy. How, and at the same time, we are also finding that uh, the consumption pattern in India has dropped substantially thanks to the uh, dip in the industrial activity as such in the last uh, couple of years. So when that be the case, uh, how are we really going to handle uh, this situation and see to it that uh, we come back to the pre uh, what do you call uh, pre-2014 era? Uh, <laughs> uh, I think that and it, should it, we it be going there at all? It, it began as an innocuous question about yeah. power, and it's become a loaded question about you know <laughs> a, a growth in the last many years. Look, um, uh, I think that getting growth into the eight to 10% range, I think is, is absolutely desirable uh, and necessary for the Indian economy. Um, I, I, I think the whole challenge of policy making now is how do you revive investment? How do you get growth up uh, and so on? Uh, and you know, m the diagnosis that we had made and I had made uh, two, three years ago 
uh, was that one of the critical problems was this twin balance sheet problem that you know there was over borrowing and over lending during the boom period and now we, we saddled with the legacy of that. I think that with the resolution process under the IBC and now the recapitalization of the banks, uh, I think we're uh, you know, uh, taking the steps necessary to revive investment and get credit growth back up again. So I think let's see how this whole thing is going to pan out. The world economy is picking up. Let's see whether you know, uh, the Indian economy can also on the basis of these things uh, come back up again. So, so maybe two years from now, when, if the Hindu Center is kind enough to invite me, we can see whether, uh, you know, what has happened by that time. Thank you, sir. Thank okay. You, thank you. Last question. I, I will remember you as the contemplative economist. Yes. <laughs> Last question from Lokeshwari. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to understand your experience with other countries with a federal structure. How have they gone about with their uh, power, power distribution, power generation, and all that? Uh, how can we adapt some of that into India? Um, see, I, 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 honest answer is that I haven't studied. I, I thought you were going to ask how you, whether you've studied other countries in the GST, which I have uh, to some extent. But I, I, I haven't studied closely, to be honest, how other federal structures have handled power. No, I, I haven't studied that, but it's a very good question. And I shall go back, uh, you know, uh, actually I'll go back and try and get some examples of how they do that. Uh, um, the United States, you know, I know to, 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 to some extent, but not in great detail. Uh, but I do think they do have, you know, a lot of, um, uh, in a sense, competitive federalism because, uh, you know, California, for example, right, uh, and many states, for example, California has like a commitment to 100% renewables by a certain uh, point in time. And I think what that, that has created some very interesting things that, uh, you know, it's basically said, uh, you know, even if the federal government is going to pull out of Paris, we will still you know, try and contribute to global warming with our own things. So there's a lot of competitive federalism in the United States. Uh, uh, and in some cases, you know, what has happened, of course, is that the price of power has been negative as well. Because what happens is that when the sun is shining, uh, you have too much power. Uh, and, and you can't handle it, so you have to give it away free, for example. So there are all these very interesting experiments going on. I don't know it as well as I should, uh, but I think it's, it's a very good question, and I shall go and study it. Thank you very much. I think uh, we'll bring the discussion to a close here. Um, it's been you know, really inform informative and engrossing, and I must apologize on behalf of the audience for having hogged a little bit too much of your time with my own questions. I just wish that I had a little bit more time. Thank uh, you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the, 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 the only thing I'd like to say is that whoosh, I escaped the demonetization question. <laughs>